Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and this is 40%. Yeah, <laughs> all right, have fun, guys. All right, so in picking up where we left off, we're going to talk a little bit more about the epidemic I've been calling retractionism, of which Yuli Lin's paper finally falls victim to in November of 2013. And since all of what we've been looking at has been driven by Nature Magazine, the most prestigious scientific journal on all the realm, I felt it appropriate to take a look at their retraction track record. And the first thing that pops up is this butt-saving apologist softball of an article published in none other than Nature Magazine. And not all that long ago, on August 2nd, 2022. And just look at the eights that can be pulled from this date. You know, Octan Scheiser. But in this article, the author states that, on its face, the increase in retractions is good, a sign that science is becoming more scrutinized and rigorous, and that scientific publishing is doing its job. But it's not that simple. Journals publish more papers than they did in 1756, or even in 2016. A higher proportion is now being retracted, but we estimate, on the basis of evidence from surveys, studies, and reports from sleuths, who of course have no vested interest in the outcomes of these surveys, studies, and reports, that one in 50 papers would meet at least one of the criteria for retraction from the Committee on Publications Ethics, or COPE. <laughs> I love that the, the, the organization that monitors this is called COPE. They have to cope with all these retractions. And it was formed 25 years ago, so this is not all that old an organization. You know, who was watchdogging them before they had to COPE? <laughs> I don't know. But the criteria that COPE creates is one that includes clear evidence that the findings are unreliable whether because of falsified data, plagiarism, fake peer review, or just major error, which might involve contaminated cell lines or another non-fraudulent problem. Yet the rate of retraction is still under 10th of a percent. But they estimate that 1 in 50 papers meet the criteria for retraction. That's 2%, or roughly 20 times more than what's being retracted. Which is interesting because the author of this paper is co-founder of something called Retraction Watch, which is a scientific journal watchdog group that reports on academic retractions. But I think the estimated number of retractable papers is quite low because, as this article says, there are more scientific journals than ever flooding the academic marketplace. And in 2021, Retraction Watch indexed over 3,000 retractions, 5% of which were COVID-related. Over 200 COVID-related papers have been retracted, and that was just in 2021 alone. And I didn't go through all of them, but there were, in fact, 267 of them. But I did go through enough of them to see that articles focusing outside the mainstream narrative didn't fare all that well with the retraction police, as evidenced by its number one retraction, 5G technology and induction of coronavirus in skin cells, which was published in the Biological Regulators and Homeostatic Agents magazine on July 16, 2020. And it was withdrawn on July 24, 2020. So this article only lasted about a week. And this is also evidenced by the second to last paper, paper number 266 that was retracted. Why are we vaccinating children against COVID-19? And that was published on September 14th, 2021 in Toxicology Reports. And there was a correction published on October 7th, 2021, followed by an expression of concern published on December 17th before the article was finally retracted on May 6th, 2022. And so knowing how corrupt this system is, how many articles are out there that support the pandemic's narrative that contain fraudulent science and remain unretracted? I mean, we may never know. But before we move on to close out all this retraction business, it's important to note that not all retractions are due to the misconduct of scientists. There are many benign reasons a paper may be retracted only to be reinstated once whatever corrections that needed to be made are made. But the point of all this is to demonstrate just how rampant this problem is. And it's a problem the general public is woefully ignorant of, just as they're woefully ignorant of how monopolized the flow of this information is. And since Nature Magazine is the most prestigious scientific journal on all the realm, wielding a profound influence in the scientific community, I wanted to find out who publishes Nature Magazine. And at the bottom of this article, they're kind enough to let us know that Nature Magazine is published by Springer Nature Limited. 
And so Springer Nature Limited, or just Springer Nature, is home to the world's most influential journals, more than 3,000 of them. Talk about cornering a market. And this publication empire known as Springer Nature is the result of the mergers of several different publication houses, emerging in 2015 as this Springer Nature. And Springer Nature is a privately held group that in 2019 had revenue of $1.72 billion. Right? It has two owners, Hold Spring Publishing Group and BC Partners. And so Falcon's Maze for Nature Magazine and Springer Nature starts with Holtz Brink Publishing Group, who owns 53% of Springer Nature. And this is where the story starts to get nuts, because Holtz Brink is a privately held German company based in Stuttgart, which owns publishing companies worldwide. And it was founded by this guy, George von Holtz Brink, in 1948, or just a few years after World War Gateway. And interestingly enough, George von Holtz Brink's name literally translates to George of the Forest Pasture. And it's interesting that he goes into publishing with this last name, considering that publishing is an industry that takes the lives of trees, right? But, but despite that, you know who loves pastures by the forest? Satyrs do. And knowing that satyrs can be guardians of gateways through their association with Janus, and what better gateways are there than books? And also throwing in Baltimore's veneration of satyrs, you know, this story is really starting to heat up, right? So George of the Forest Pasture, Right, he starts this publishing company as a subscriber-only book club in 1948. And by the 1960s, he starts buying up other German publishing houses, and then by the 80s, working its way into the English-language publishing houses. And then in 1995, they purchased 70% majority interest in Macmillan Group, and then purchased the rest of it in 1999. And it's through this ownership of Macmillan that they become one of the top five English publishers in the world. But one thing Holt Spring Publishing Group wasn't too keen on sharing is that George of the Forest Pasture here was one of these idiots. And so when Holt Spring tried to buy up a bunch of American publishers in the 1980s, which, he, which they successfully did, there was an investigation launched into the history of George von Holt Spring. And they found out that in 1931, he joined the Nazi Young Workers Party. And in 1933, he became member number... 2,126,353 of the party, and that Holtzbrink's Nazi past was successfully concealed for many years. And so with the apparent full transparency of Holtzbrink Publishing Group, it's determined that Georgie is okay, right? Because, because as Nazis go, Holtzbrink was small pills, and I never heard that before, that must be a German thing. He wasn't a mass murderer or a mastermind of anti-Semitic propaganda. His company wasn't a Krupps or an IG Farben an industrial giant which funded Hitler and exploited slave labor. He was probably not even an especially enthusiastic Nazi, right? He was merely a petty opportunist. Even though he stayed loyal to the party until the end of the war, he published four Nazi-approved magazines and produced books for the German army, which he serves from 1943 until the end of the war. But yeah, he's okay. You know, petty opportunist, right? He was, he was no Nazi war criminal but he cleverly took advantage of a favorable economic situation from which he profits in three ways. Right? The, first, the first way he profits is that the publication of these Nazi magazines and books for the stormtroopers helps him to build up the capital, which turns this door-to-door -door salesman into a substantial publisher. Because this is allegedly how the party finds him, as a poor young man selling books door-to-door. -door. The second way in which he profits is that he manages to squirrel away several tons of newsprint, a scarce commodity which very few people had access to in the aftermath of the war. Right? Of course, right? Because of his relationship to the trees. Right? And having all of this newsprint gives him a lucrative head start in the race to reestablish publishing operations after the defeat of the Nazis. Right? And third, the third way he benefits is that much of his competition, the great Jewish-owned publishing houses of, of pre-Nazi Germany, was destroyed. How convenient! But he silently atones for the sins of his wartime past by cultivating friendships with Jewish leaders and supporting their causes, particularly in Jerusalem. There's a novel idea for you, the Nazi Zionist, right? And he loves the idea of Zionism so much that he was super chummy with the mayor of Jerusalem, right? Who gives a tribute at his funeral. But regardless of what the Holtzbrinks Publishing Group's PR firm wants us to think about all of this, it is very interesting that one of the big five English-speaking language publishing houses is presently owned by a company with such known affiliations, you know, especially one that starts right after the war, just as the final ethnicization of the word Viking takes off after the war.
And what makes this even crazier is that there is another publisher in the English language Big Five that has party ties, and that would be Penguin Random House. Because Penguin Random House is a subsidiary of Bertelsmann, and Bertelsmann right, is a German private multinational conglomerate corporation based in Guttersloh, North Rhine, Westphalia. And Westphalia is a name that we've seen many times before. And so Bertelsmann is one of the world's largest media conglomerates, and it is also active in the service sector and education. Bertelsmann was founded as a publishing house by Carl Bertelsmann in 1835, making it one of Germany's oldest publishing houses. And in a very similar situation to what happened with Holtzbrink, when Bertelsmann tried to buy some English language publishers, an investigation was launched into what Bertelsmann's role was during World War Gateway. And so there was an 800-page volume published in this of this investigation where it, finds, where it was noted that, among other things, that the company had prospered as the leading book supplier to the German army and also contracted work to printing presses in German-occupied Lithuania that used Jewish slave labor. And again, I didn't dig that deep, but 800 pages who knows what else is in there, right? And so let's get this straight, right? Two of the top five English language publishing houses are owned by companies with ties to the party. That's a 40% share of the English speaking market. And so between Holtzbrink's control over Macmillan and Springer Nature and this monopoly over scientific journals that they hold and the Bertelsmann Entertainment Empire, which besides publishing includes a record label, broadcasting, cable television, film production, yeah, they had revenue of almost 19 billion euros in 2021. Total assets of almost 32 billion. And so this is big money, right? It seems that being the manufacturer and distributor of Nazi propaganda during the war really pays off for these companies, right? So I'm glad that they have a 40% share in what the English-speaking world reads. I think this is absolutely incredible. And so now that we know about Holtzbrink's checkered past and how that led us to Bertelsmann, Let's see what we can find out about BC Partners, right? who is the other owner of Springer Nature. And so BC Partners is a British international investment firm with over $40 billion of assets under management across private equity, credit, and real estate in Europe and North America, with global headquarters in London. And since its inception, BC Partners has completed 113 private equity investments in companies with a total enterprise value of $145 billion. But maybe the most interesting thing about BC Partners is that until recently, they were the majority shareholder of Intelsat, the global satellite services provider valued at $16.6 .6 billion when they bought it in 2007. And so I have to wonder how recently this divestment was because Intelsat is a multinational satellite services provider with corporate headquarters in Luxembourg and administrative headquarters in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. And as of June 2022, it operated a fleet of 52 communication satellites, which was then one of the world's largest fleets. And I love this. Was then, right? This is just like four or five months ago. What happened in the last four or five months that they are no longer one of the world's largest fleets of communication satellites? I mean, I think that's kind of interesting. But not as interesting as this, because in 2020, the company announced plans to procure, build, and launch seven C-band satellites over the next several years. And these C-band satellites will contribute to the acceleration of America's 5G build-out. And so now this is very interesting, because here we have this satellite communications company that makes billions of dollars a year. I mean, over $2 billion a year in revenue. And until recently, the majority shareholder was this BC Partners, who just so happens to be co-owner of Springer Nature, the most prestigious scientific publishing house on the realm, and who most certainly has the clout to get a pesky scientific paper or two retracted if they were so inclined. Say a paper on 5G technology and the induction of coronavirus in skin cells? I mean, this was the number one retracted study. Right? It does the investors in BC Partners and the investments made on their behalf in Intelsat with their 5G acceleration program, no good if 5G technology is linked to coronavirus outbreaks. And so I don't know if this is still being pushed as one of the reasons for the pandemic, but at one time it certainly was, you know, that the introduction of all these broadband frequencies like 5G, and I love this image for 5G with its subliminal flat earth programming in here. 5G serving up your reality on a silver platter. But do or can these frequencies like 5G, 4G, or whatever else is out there, could they be waking up latent viruses in the human body 
a la the terrain model of virology, right? It certainly seems plausible to me. And 5G causing coronavirus outbreaks is certainly an idea you would want squashed if you invested billions of dollars in 5G satellite technology, as BC partners may have done or probably did, you know, because who knows when this divestment happened? You know, I, I didn't seek that out. And this demonstration of the links and possible collusion between all these private, for-profit companies like BC Partners and Intelsat and Bertelsmann right, and Holtzbrink and Springer Nature. You know, the relationship of all of these companies and how scientific, cultural, and historical information is disseminated to the public is very interesting, at least to the Mud City paradigm it is anyway. All right, so now it's time to look at the Springer Nature branch of the puzzle tree. Right? And Springer Nature, as discussed, is just the public face of this massive, privately held publishing concern. Right? And they get the name Springer from this guy, Julius Springer. And he was the only child of merchant Isidore Springer and his wife Marianne, who died in childbirth. The Jewish father had acquired citizenship in Berlin and had himself baptized, meaning he converted from Judaism to whatever the most popular Christian faith was in Westphalia at the time, I guess. Right? There's no specifics. Just as there was no mention that I could find of Julius Springer's religious affiliation. You know, did his father not convert him over? Did he remain Jewish? Right? And this Jewish question will plague the Springer family for generations to come. Right? And so Julius here, when he gets out of school as a young man, he takes on an apprenticeship at a bookstore. And this apprenticeship allows him to travel all over Europe. Right? Switzerland, Zurich, Stuttgart, Paris. You know, it must be nice to just get out of school and travel for your bookstore. Right? And on his 25th birthday, he opens his own bookstore in Berlin at this Brielstrasse 20, which is today house number 11. Right? You cannot make this stuff up. It's just unbelievable. Right? And his bookshop, the foundation of his bookshop, was carefully prepared and financially well secured. The contribution of his silent partner, A. Faudel, alone amounted to 3,000 silver talers. And so I looked it up 3,000 silver talers in 1842 is roughly the equivalent of $100,000 today. And in 1842, $100,000 was a lot of money. And so looking, I could find nothing on this A-Faudel. Nada. Zip. All right, so it's interesting that he's a silent partner in this bookstore, which turns into a massive success. And after 16 years in Berlin, Julius sells this bookstore and becomes a publisher full-time in Monbijou Platz. Right, and he starts the imprint Verlag von Julius Springer, and they publish an increasing number of school books, nonfiction, and specialist books, but also books for young people and works of fiction. But it's the expansion efforts developed by his children and his grandchildren that raise the Springer Verlag imprint to the status as one of the largest and most prestigious scientific publishing houses. Right, but given what we now know about Bertelsmann right, and Holtzbrink, I had to take a look and see if Springer Verlag had any party affiliations, especially since they get a big boost from this Heinz Goodsey right after the war. But before there can be an after the war, there has to be a during the war. And surface accounts don't paint the most pleasant picture for the Springer family. All right, so Julius here, he has 10 children, three of whom survive to adulthood. That is a 70% mortality rate for the children of Julius Springer. You know, and something just doesn't seem right about that to me, even given the era. But regardless, two of his three children follow dear old dad into the publishing business. But being allegedly Jewish, the family has a rough go of it during the war, where his two surviving sons meet their end. Right? One choosing suicide at the age of 94 years old over concentration camp living, and the other dying in a concentration camp. And of Julius's grandchildren, who were running Springer Verlag at the time of the war, Ferdinand Jr. and Julius, both of whom were veterans of World War I, one of them does get interned in a concentration camp, but both escape the final solution when they agree to have their publishing house Aryanized. Right? The publishing house was Aryanized under Tunis Lang. Thanks to his loyal attitude, the Springer family's publishing house survived so that the two publishers were able to resume their work after the end of the war. And I did find a reference to Tunis Lang being one of the owners of Springer Verlag after the end of the Second World War. And so par for the course, I could find nothing else regarding this Tunis Lang. But it sure is interesting that he Aryanizes the publishing house that goes on to be one of the largest scientific publishers in the world. Because this is the first time that I've seen the word Aryan come up in this context. 
which is amazing because it's in regards to a scientific publishing house. When this whole thing started by looking into whether or not concepts like Arianism were deliberately manufactured or engineered as a catalyst for, or at the very least, an agitator of the fragile fractals, creating a focal point villain for a large scale socio political identity driven world you wish to dominate from afar, right? And so, and so having the word Arian pop up for the first time here is really amazing, right? So we have this guy helping them out after the Second World War, but what of Heinz Gutzi, who was brought on board in 1949 and plays an important part in making Springer Verlag one of the largest scientific publishers in the world? And this guy has an incredible story. All right, so Heinz Gutzi, he was born into a political family. His father was essentially treasurer of Dresden, right? He goes to school in Dresden, where he studies classical archaeology, history, and art history at the universities of Leipzig, München, and Naples. And in 1938, he receives his doctorate in Leipzig with a dissertation on Attic three-figure reliefs. As a postdoc, he goes to the German Archaeological Institute in Rome, but he was drafted into the German military in 1939 into the Luftwaffe, which was the Nazi Air Force. So it's 1939, and the Nazi war machine is nearing the height of its power. Whatever is the SS to do with this nerdy doctor of archaeology they just drafted? Well, if there's anything Raiders of the Lost Ark has taught us, it's that Der Fuhrer was obsessed with archaeology and esoteric mystery schools. This Heinz Gutzi guy could be very useful. But what's this? In 1946, he returned from captivity. Who was holding him captive? Is it the implication that it was the German army that was holding him captive? Or was it the Allies? Unfortunately, the few gatekeeping articles I found for Heinz offer nothing in the way of answers there. But it's very interesting that a doctor of archaeology who is in the German Air Force, you know, commanded by this guy, would be such an integral part of Springer Verlang and their post-war success. He eventually ends up heading the company in the late 50s and 60s, right when science and technology is exploding into the public marketplace, and not to mention anything else that may have been going on in the private sector. And so for those keeping score at home, that's now three major publishing houses that have party ties that are wrapped up in the big five publishing houses in the English language. It's almost enough to make one question, who actually won this war? How is it that three publishers of Nazi propaganda go on to own 40% of the English-speaking publishing market? Right? And the answer to that is simple. Right? Since they were so good at pumping out Nazi propaganda, it would have been a shame to let all that good propaganda infrastructure go to waste. Right? So the Allies just had them start publishing Allied propaganda instead, which they were more than happy to do and were able to parlay into controlling 40% of English propaganda. Right? And through all of this, we have still yet to get to the root of this story, and that's Nature Magazine. And so we'll pick it up here in the next Party Crashing episode. Remember, guys, just because you don't know the truth doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lies. Right? So until part two, cheers.